hopefully by fall, I mean we've got it approved by the state chemist and everything, we'll have we'll have an improved form of that product too. <coughs> uh, when you add this, you know, rose oil I had mm -hmm. from last year, do you pull back the, uh, the uh, compost or not the compost? Depends on whether or not you have a dog. That's the one thing about that product is that the puppy dogs sometimes like to eat it. So if you have dogs that want to get out there and eat your rose glow, pull the mulch back, put it down, and then put the mulch back on top of it. Thank goodness my Hannah puppy has not decided that it tastes good even though it has alfalfa in it. She likes her monster dog food better. So I can just put it on the surface and forget about it. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, when you put it on top, any fertilizer is going to leach down through into the soil. Ideally, it'd be best to put it on the soil, put the mulch on top, because then you've got more microbes directly in contact with it to break it down faster. If you have time to do that, I envy you. <laughs> Most of us just get out there and do this. It's another nice thing about organics is you don't have to water it in. Where I live in Kendall County, I can only turn that hose on one day a week. Um, I do have to admit that occasionally if I have a spot that really needs a lot of water, I'll go over and I'll bathe Hannah in that spot, let the hose run a while while I'm giving her a bath, but I think I'm still within the law, but nice thing the organics don't have to be watered in, they don't burn, so we try to make it as easy as possible. I would say if you have squirrels, I've learned the hard way, don't leave it on top. Really? The they like to dig and eat? Yeah. Sprinkle a little blood meal around with it to run the squirrels off. And they may be squirrels to her, they're bushy-tailed tree rats to me, and they can all do something like this. Blasted things, I know that I'm going to have a problem with them stealing tomatoes this year, so um, as soon as we're past baby season, I'll be trapping and relocating again. Fun little plant, short-lived perennial. You're not going to have this plant a long time. You're going to have it for maybe for two years, maybe three years. But when you see this plant growing in and flower, and I think we've still got a patch of it out there in the parking lot, it is something to hold. It will literally have thousands of either purple or white flowers on it. But this plant is called Nirembergia. This form of it is called purple robe. The white form is naturally called uh, white robe. And guess what the lavender form is called? Starry night. I don't know why they did that. But anyway, this is the purple robe uh, uh, Nirembergia. And it is a neat plant. Again, it's one of the... Most perennials, I don't encourage our growers to grow them in four-inch pots because you don't get pretty. In fact, many of them, I think you have to get them into a two- or three-gallon container before they really look good. This is one of the ones you can buy in a small pot that grows out really well. But if you want something that stays low, bright shade to full sun, plant some Nirembergia sometime. You'll love it for two years. Expect to replace it after two to three years, but at a buck or two for a pot, it's really really worth the investment. It doesn't take very many pots to fill a fairly good area. Asclepius we already talked a bit about. Um, just plant it in the sun and enjoy it. And enjoy the butterflies. Enjoy the beneficials and uh, interesting plant. Bob, you said it could be grown in a pot. But a pot like uh, 20 inches? I'd put grow it, yeah, in a almost whiskey barrel. Plant. pot that big, I'd probably put three. And it's not because, you know, it will grow that much better in a big pot. But it just looks prettier if you put two or three of them together. Put that one thing in, in one pot, and it's not real showy. Now, I know a lot of y'all came to Donna's seminar, Planting Containers, where she showed you all the beautiful combinations. If you didn't make it to that, I guess, I think it's next Saturday's seminar, is Donna doing hanging baskets, where she will show you how she not only combines things in the top, but she pokes holes in the side of it plant things hanging out through it, be sure and come to that seminar. But no, if you want to grow that, grow it in a big pot, but put maybe three plants together or put something else with it. Uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. Plumbago. I mean, you talk about a trouble-free plant. Now, the deer will eat this, so I'm not going to tell you it's the greatest thing in deer country. But this plant, the original form was kind of a sky blue color, and it, to me it always looked kind of faded, kind of so-so. Then they came out with this newer color they called imperial blue, and these things are just absolutely spectacular in mass. I think, again, when you get ready to leave, if you look out on the far edge of the parking lot, I think we've got a fairly good size, a uh, couple of plants of this growing over there. People say, how tall does it grow? It'll grow as tall as you have something to support it. At one point, before we trimmed that big uh, Pride of Houston yoke on there to a tree form, it was bushy all the way to the ground. 
some of the plumbago somehow got wound into it and it just kept going and going and you literally had to look up to see the flowers. This was a 10 foot tall plumbago. But again, it's not going to support itself and get that tall. Uh, this plant, if you didn't prune it and if we didn't have a cold winter, would probably top out about 5 feet. In general, I'm going to tell you it's going to get to about 3 feet. But the new dark blue color is absolutely wonderful. There's also a pure white form of this that's really good in some gardens. I don't think I've ever seen a, an insect problem of any sort on this plant. Uh, if anything, it can be a bit of a nuisance, especially if you have hairy arms, because when the, uh, as these little seed things mature and they don't come up from seed, but they get a little sticky, uh, it's like a gland on there that makes a real sticky thing, and of course in nature that's an adaptation to get the seed spread around because an animal walks by all the seed sticks to it and gets licked off or falls off somewhere else. If I get out and I'm working on this later in the summer when the seed is mature, I'll have about 500 of those things stuck to my arm and you sit there pulling them off. And uh, But there's just very little goes wrong with plumbago. doesn't have to be deadheaded. You can trim it back in the middle of the summer if it gets too big. And talk about something again that you can plant out and forget about it other than occasional water and fertilizer and that thing will reward you with huge numbers of flowers. Agapanthus, again, um, the most important thing to know about agapanthus is it's not a wimp. That plant, as I said, really loves hot sun. And if you plant it in the shade, it'll be a beautiful plant, but it won't have very many flowers. If you like the flowers, Put it out in good sun and understand that once again there are several varieties of this plant. Now I'll tell you one other thing about it, it is another excellent cut flower. You can cut it at this stage when these little buds first are starting to open. That thing will keep easily two weeks as a cut flower if you keep the water fresh and they are just gorgeous. This is the dwarf form which is called Peter Pan. That is about as high as the foliage is ever going to get and this is about as high as the blooms are ever going to get. The standard agapanthus, lily of the Nile is its common name, the foliage will be about as high as the blooms are on this, and the blooms will be up about this height. Again, you know, we go to the west coast not as often as we want to because we used to have a lot of orchid growers out there, and when we were growing more orchids commercially, we were out picking out seedlings and things out there, but if you find yourself in the San Francisco area, drive by in late spring and just look at the agapanthus. They have this planted in the medians of some of the streets, and it'll be one of the most spectacular things you have ever seen. There's also a pure white form of this. The dwarfs in the white are hard to find, but the standard big tall white are fairly common. Nowadays, there is one that is a midnight blue color. There's an agapanthus that's, you know, that color, or actually with more blue in it than that kind of lavender cast. But uh, that one's called Elaine. There's another one that's called May Night, or no, Mood Indigo, I think, is the other one. But uh, the flowers on the super dark blue ones are not quite as showy. They're a little bit more open. They don't make the compact umble, is what this is called, technically. But... Uh, Agapanthus are sure worth growing if you have the space. If you have limited space, I always say grow something that's going to bloom all summer long. If you have a lot of space that you can plant things, plant some things even if they're only pretty for a month or two out of the year because it just makes all the difference. When these things are in bloom again, that's the kind of thing that people drive off the road trying to see what it is when there's a bed full. Yes, ma'am? I have one that someone gave me with the intentions that I was going to plant it and mm -hmm. I got around to it. In the ground and it's growing in a pot. It's just really full, and I want to take some out and transplant it. How uh -huh. do I do that? Okay, when does it bloom? Spring. It? Yeah. Okay, they bloom in the spring, so when do we divide it? In the fall. Yeah. If you're going to plant the plant intact, plant it any time. If you wanted to cut it into more than one piece, if it's really gotten large, then do it in the fall. <coughs> You're going to find the roots are almost as big around as these bloom spikes. The, the roots are incredibly heavy things. You're going to be after it with a machete or an axe, or you're going to get halfway through and decide to heck with it and plant the whole thing in a clump and let it fend for itself. <laughs> but it's a tough, hardy plant. And, yeah. pot, and I was thinking I was going to have to break the pot because I didn't think I could You sometimes get to the point that you do have to. Bob? Yes? The leaf tips turn yellow. What should that tell me? It tells you you've got root damage. 
Too wet or too dry. That's the whole thing. People come in and they say, what's wrong? And I say, well, it's either too wet or too dry. And they look at me like, you think I'm some kind of a dummy? I could have figured that out. But no, anything that causes root damage will cause dead leaf tips. It could be too wet. It could be too dry. If you're still using miracle Grow, it could be you know chemical fertilizer burn. Uh, it could be a lot of different things. But it's, in most cases, probably, if it's not physical damage. Now, this is physical damage from having being put on 